Hello, it's Scott Manley here. There's a certain type of person on the internet who likes to tell me that rocket engines can't work in a vacuum. These people don't understand Newton's third law of physics, and I know that all of you out there understand Newton's third law, but many of you are asking me, how do you actually test a rocket engine in a vacuum? Because obviously, Vacuum of space is very different from the environment on Earth. And if you're testing an engine that is going to go out into deep space and you're not going to be able to mess around with it, you want to know that it's going to work in that environment. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. You probably know that uh, the second stage engines on a lot of rockets use very large nozzle extensions because by expanding the exhaust over a wider area, you get better specific impulse and better performance. But these large nozzle extensions are fragile. And if you try to fire one of these engines with a large nozzle extension in the atmosphere, then the gas coming out the far end is actually below atmospheric pressure and the air would squeeze in between the rocket exhaust and the wall of the nozzle. And when it does that, it's called flow separation. And it's a kind of chaotic environment that causes the uh, flow to bump around inside there and can easily damage these fragile nozzles. So you want to test without that environment there. Now you could just test the rocket engine without the nozzle extension, but then you're not testing the way you would actually fly. There's other issues that can happen. Uh, for example, when trying to light an engine, having air around it completely changes the dynamics. Uh, when you try to you, when you try to light something, then you've got this get hot gas around it, and if that hot gas is flowing away too quickly because there's no air to constrain it, the engine may not light. I remember a few years ago, Cody's lab doing a demonstration of how to light these little uh, model rocket motors inside a vacuum chamber, and it kept on failing until he put it inside a little pressurized capsule and lit it there. Then it blew out the bottom of the capsule. So. This is a legitimate problem. Similarly, if you're lighting a liquid fueled engine, you may be spraying your propellants into the combustion chamber and then they evaporate too quickly to light properly in a vacuum. During early parts of the ignition, you've got all these sort of transient conditions and you might have combustion instability right at the very start of the engine that is suppressed by the Earth's atmosphere that uh, it would, well, it may uh, become critical when you're actually flying in deep space. And then, of course, there's the problem that when you're operating in a vacuum, you can't rely on things like conduction of heat to the environment around you. You have to radiate that heat away. And you know, operating in space is generally a completely different condition because you've got a lot of very cold, dark sky around you and a very hot sun in one place. So there's a real need to test space vehicles in all these environments. So, yes, you can put spacecraft in a vacuum chamber. And in fact, you can test a rocket engine in a vacuum chamber. The problem, of course, is that once you start firing a rocket engine, it is emitting a lot of high pressure, hot exhaust gas. And if you don't have a very big vacuum chamber, it's going to fill that up very quickly and you're not testing in a vacuum anymore. You can actually do this for very low mass flow engines. Things like electric thrusters can be tested in a vacuum chamber with your know, mechanical vacuum pumps. You, you know, you just get it down to whatever pressure you're testing at. And then the mass flow rate of these ion thrusters is so low that uh, you can generally keep this thing at a usable pressure for a very long period of time. However, if you're having, say, something like Vasimir, or you're using magnetic confinement on a hot plasma, the plasma that does come out is so hot that you need a water jacket to cool down the vacuum chamber while you're testing. But once you get up to larger engines, this simply isn't possible. If you think about it, a rocket engine is something that's designed to take fluids, combust them, produce a lot of gas very, very quickly. This is what they're optimized for. And there's no way that you can build a vacuum chamber with a bunch of mechanical pumps that can keep up with this perfectly optimized beast of a rocket engine. So you need to use the rocket engine to actually help you out with a pumping mechanism. What you'll typically do is after the rocket engine's nozzle, you'll have a cylindrical section, a long tunnel, which is referred to as diffuser. And this uses a basically fluid mechanics, uh, the Venturi, it's something like the Venturi effect, although it's not technically the same thing. You set it up in such a way that the shock waves coming off the lip of the nozzle impinge on the wall of the vacuum tube and then sort of bounce down the tube. 
that makes it very hard for uh, molecules to flow in one direction, but very easy to flow in the other direction. So what this rocket engine is doing is blowing all the gas down here. And if there's any gas in the test chamber near the engine, then it will get sucked down this uh, diffuser and exhausted out of the system. So you can literally just have like a closed chamber with a diffuser, the engine inside the chamber. And once that engine lights, it will suck all the gas out of the chamber and you're then firing in vacuum conditions. Now, if you want to test ignition under vacuum conditions, then you need a door at the end, which uh, closes up. And, you know, this can just be sort of closed up and held on. And then when you evacuate the chamber, literally the air pressure will hold it in place until the engine fires, at which point it pops off. And you've got a rocket engine firing down this tunnel. It's in ambient vacuum conditions at initial uh, init ignition. And it will maintain that during the burn. And then once you get towards the end of the burn and you have to turn the engine off, then you can have a bit of trouble because you've then got all this atmosphere that's pushing to get back in. And that can actually damage the engine as it flows back. It can damage the chamber if it's not designed properly. So you will sometimes then find a system with fast closing shutters that as soon as they detect airflow backwards up the tunnel, the shutters will actuate shut very, very quickly and provide you a closed tunnel. Another thing about the diffuser, this uh, enclosed tunnel section, is that it is dealing with a lot of thermal flux from the engines. So you want to make sure that you have this kept cool. It's quite common to find these with a water jacket around them so that uh, the, the tunnel doesn't get too hot. So this works for a lot of engines, but once you get to these very high expansion ratio engines, the pressure of the exhaust is low enough that the atmosphere at the far end can't be kept out. So you need to actively, you need active pumps to keep the downstream flow at lower pressure. And while, again, you might imagine arrays of vacuum pumps powered by, you know, the massive power grid or something, they actually tend to use something called steam ejectors. And a steam ejector does actually use the Venturi effect. The idea is that with the Venturi effect, you have a jet of gas and it will entrain atmosphere around it. So you will reduce the velocity of this and increase the absolute momentum flux. And so you can use that to suck gas out. So what you will have is downstream from the diffuser. First of all, you'll have typically a cooling system where you spray water in cool down the exhaust and just by cooling the exhaust down and condensing some of it you're actually going to reduce the pressure a whole lot. Downstream from that you might then have a steam ejector where the flow continues and then is given more energy by a steam injection system. You might have multiple steam ejectors to keep the mass flow up you know to you know to basically counteract the rocket engine that is desperately trying to fill every possible space with gas and you're trying to suck that all out. So the great thing about this is that you can prep for a test by having huge boilers, reservoirs full of water that is heated to like 250 Celsius that's kept at pressure. And as soon as the test starts, you just open those valves and all the energy in this gas, in this uh, steam, this water, is being used to help clear out the exhaust pathway. And you will see, you know, two, three stages sometimes on these exhaust systems. That also helps, say, for example, if you've got an engine which has uh, uh, like a solid motor, which will be outputting acids and uh, dust and things like that. This, the water will actually help capture that. And then you can capture the water and use it for, you know, clean it up before you release it into the environment rather than, say, spraying a whole bunch of chemicals into the world around you. So, yeah, these facilities can be exceptionally large. In fact, during the Apollo program, they built a system that didn't just test the J2 engine they actually tested the entire third stage of the Saturn V in a vacuum chamber with an engine extraction system that allowed them to test the J2 engine. And you know, these large test chambers, they don't, all, they don't just replicate a vacuum. With the right conditioning, you can also add, say, uh, cooling panels on the wall where you cool it with liquid nitrogen to make the whole chamber cold. And then perhaps on one side, you will have uh, thermal lamps that are heating just one side of your system to replicate uh, what you might see in space. Or you could have actually the heating source moving around to simulate, say, a barbecue roll. Um, you can also simulate the RF environment. So you can do entire stage, you know, test the entire system this way if you want. 
For example, NASA recently released videos showing testing of the Mars Ascent Vehicle Propulsion System. These are solid rocket motors, but they're going to operate from the surface of Mars. And so they had to test it in a vacuum chamber with the, a diffuser to capture the exhaust, but they also had to chill it down to the ambient temperatures that would be expected on Mars to make sure that the solid rocket motors would actually light under those conditions. There's another test, I don't think they did this at vacuum pressure, but they actually spun the motor around because the second stage of the Mars Ascent vehicle is going to be spin stabilized. And you don't want to find out that when you spin your rocket motor that suddenly the fuel doesn't burn in exactly the same way. There is a multitude of engineering effects which you want to identify on the ground before you go to space. And that is why these engine test facilities are so large and complicated and are able to extend to cover as many environments as possible. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.